Uh, I brought this today. You might not be able to read that. It says Super Bowl 21. I'll take you back to 1987. Actually, had a fr I was in graduate school at the time. And I had a friend that took me to the game. It was at the Rose Bowl. And it was the Broncos and the New York Giants. How many of you remember that? How many of you were born uh, at that time and alive? And uh, actually, I didn't get this. Somebody else that was, I found out later that was a part of the church was at the game and had this. And he had sat on it, obviously, a few times <laughs> since the game. And, but he gave me this. And I keep this in my office at home uh, as a reminder uh, that there's always hope for breakthrough. <laughs> because back in 1987, this was uh, John Elway's fourth year in the, in the league, and we were up 10-9 at halftime. And it just so happens that Bill Belichick was the defensive coordinator for the Giants at the time. And... They killed us, 39 to 20. It was quite depressing. We were in another Super Bowl after that. But then, uh, fast forward 10 years, again, there is always hope for breakthrough. Then we won back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And so whenever I look at that in my office, I'm reminded of my friend that gave it to me, reminded of being at the game, and also that you just... Hold on, because you never know what's coming. Because you, how many of you relate, how many of you lived in Denver during those years? Isn't it true, and it's still true, that what was going on with the Broncos affected the whole city? And there was this, it was like, oh my gosh, are we ever going to win? It was the most depressing thing. We have the most amazing quarterback ever, an amazing team. And it was just it's amazing how it affects the attitude of the city and the front range and our state. And an amazing thing when then we finally broke through and won and then back to back. And, and I, I can't imagine what Denver would be like if that hadn't have happened. But I always look back at that and I remember sitting there and actually we were sitting in the south. South stands are different in, at the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum, but... We were, we were in the South area among a ton of Giants fans. And I was so excited and loud in the first half. <laughs> Quiet, irritated, and miscellaneous other things in the second half. <laughs> and you're going to see how all of this fits together in a minute. Okay, so we're in Acts chapter 4 today, and the title of the message is The Prayer That Brings Breakthrough. And so I want to encourage you to turn there in your Bible. You can, uh, we have the English Standard Version on our SHV app as well. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can download the app or go online and read along. The Prayer That Brings Breakthrough. Have you ever wondered in the heat of battle in your own life when you're facing opposition to your faith, whether that's from people or from your own weaknesses or your own struggle with sin or if, have you ever wondered if there's like a prayer that you could pray that would bring great pleasure to God's heart when you're in that place? Have you ever wondered if there was a prayer in the Bible that was, that was kind of a spontaneous prayer that could be a cry of your heart that would align you with God's heart in any dark situation, in all struggles and battles that would actually open the door for healing and wholeness in any area of brokenness and desperation. Well, that's what we're going to look at today, one of those prayers, and it's in Acts chapter 4. Uh, would you bow with me? Let's pray before we read the scripture together. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. Lord, thank you for this example. And Lord, we all uh, can recall times in our lives when we've faced struggles, defeat, stuff that's way beyond 
the Super Bowl and sporting events, but those things just remind us of the ups and downs and and Lord, again, of how faithful you are. I pray today that you would tune us into your heart in this prayer and this story. And Lord, would you speak to us through your word? I pray for everyone in this room and everybody watching, Lord, that you would bring home to our thoughts, to our hearts, exactly what it is, Lord, you're underlining today for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week we looked at this huge miracle in chapter 3 where Peter and John prayed for the guy that was lame since birth and he was instantly healed, um, this miracle. And then Peter and John are there and they are telling all the people what had happened, that it was in the name of Jesus. And we talked about that last week. It's through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man has been healed. And then you'll notice at the end of chapter 3, um, Peter's wrapping up and he's talking about the connection back with Samuel and the prophets and Abraham and that God has raised up his servant Jesus, sending him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And then in chapter 4, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed. Everybody say, greatly annoyed. Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who'd heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. It's always um, just, it's so important to note, especially looking at these early followers of Jesus, that there was this this back and forth going on. There would be some advancement of the kingdom, heaven breaking through. And then there was this pushback and opposition. How many of you noticed that in your own journey? When you press forward and you lean in and Jesus does something, he shows up, he answers prayer, something happens in your life or you're prompted to kind of lean, try to lean in a little bit more in your relationship with Jesus, that then there tends to be opposition that comes against you. And that's this kingdom conflict that we're in that Jesus described. And so they've seen this amazing miracle, but the religious leaders are greatly annoyed. And I, I looked up that word greatly in the original language that the Bible was written in, and it means greatly. So they get thrown in jail because the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, couldn't, they didn't meet at night, they met in the morning. So they had to they put them in prison until the next morning into jail. So they're locked up. So the next day, they get them together, verse 7, and they ask them, by what power, by what name did you do this? Then verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Now you'll note here that if you imagine being there in the scene, there's about 70 people that are part of this group of religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And then there's Peter and John and the guy who's just been healed. He got to stay in jail overnight too. I, I, this is just kind of the stuff that I think about. But I just wonder, can you imagine what it would have been like to be in jail with Peter and John and you just got healed after 40 years? I'm imagining this guy being in the jail cell and he's like, I can walk. I can walk. And they're like, yes, let's get let's sleep. Let's go to sleep. He's like, no, I just want to keep walking. <laughs> he's not walked his whole life. Can you imagine the conversations? Tell me about this Jesus that in his name I was healed. Tell me more about him. Anyway, just a side note. It says, by him, Jesus, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that, the, that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Again, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. Love that. In case any of you feel inadequate or not qualified in following Jesus or to speak of Jesus to others, it's a good, good little message there. They were uneducated common men. They recognized they'd been with Jesus. That's the key. Okay? So anyway, the council gets together. They say, what are we going to do with these guys? And then verse 17, in order that it may spread no further among the people, let's warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Okay. This amazing thing happened, and everybody's in an uproar. 5,000 people just changed directions and now want to be a part of this thing with Jesus. We're greatly annoyed because they're proclaiming Jesus in him, resurrection of the dead. Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. And when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Okay, so healing, in jail overnight, arrested in jail overnight, they share their defense. And then the religious leaders no more. They tell them, command them, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Don't teach this stuff about Jesus anymore. And then I love this scene. So they leave. They've come from the temple, and they're going to hang out with this huge group of people. They've got their inner circle they've been hanging out with and praying, and, and they've experienced Pentecost. They've experienced the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus doing amazing things. And now here they are, and they go back to them. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said. Okay, so notice this. They go back to their friends. And then they lift their voices together. And somehow this happens and they're all praying this together. And they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now you'll notice here, this is very important, because they, they go back, they get together, and now they're going to have this prayer. This is, this is this part of this prayer of breakthrough. Okay? Notice, little side note here, they didn't go back and say, oh my gosh, we're freaked out. I don't know what we're going to pray. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together right now. Our Father, which art in heaven, how, I mean, there was no, this was not one of those times. How many of you have been pressed so hard in a situation where it's like all you can do is, your prayer is almost just like a sigh. Oh. And there's this beautiful, spontaneous prayer. But notice this. What they're quoting in their prayer is Psalm 2. They realize they're connected with the story. David wrote Psalm 2 when he was the king and the Gentiles and others were raging against him. But they saw in what was written by David 1,000 years before fulfillment in what was happening to them in following Jesus. Beautiful. So again, that's why we encourage you, even in doing the first five, last five, and reading the 
psalm for the day and the, and the other verses for the day so that the scripture gets in you so that you're pondering it so that when you get into a crisis situation, there's something to pray that comes from God's word beyond the sigh, right? It's a beautiful thing they identified with. They connected with the sufferings of others with the greater story. And then look at this. This is so beautiful. Verse 29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats. Notice that they didn't say, And Lord, please just protect us and keep us safe. Just protect us from these evil people. No. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I would say this is a great prayer for breakthrough, wouldn't you? Any prayer that you pray that pleases God's heart so much that the place is shaken, that's a good prayer. Okay? And there was something, this was rich with meaning, by the way, that the place was shaking. You look through the scripture at the symbolism of whenever God showed up and things were shaken. Things shaking are as a token of his presence and power. It's when God comes to set right what is wrong. It's a picture. This was a picture when they prayed this prayer that God himself now was going to come and shake things up. It was a picture that God himself was going to come and overthrow that which opposed him. When Jesus died, remember the account in Matthew 27? Three o'clock in the afternoon when he died, it says, oh, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And what happened? Matthew 27, 52, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is not like night of the living dead. This is like resurrection from the grave. This is earth splitting, earthquake shaking, God's kingdom coming to set right what is wrong. I mean, do you, I, I'm, imagine what it would be like that we would be praying something so near to God's heart that literally the place in which we're meeting would shake, that the city would shake. The goal is not shaking, right? Okay. The goal is the kingdom coming. Psalm 18, David is crying out. There are all these examples of shaking happening in the scripture but Psalm 18 he's crying out and it says that the Lord heard me that the Lord descended from on high dark clouds beneath his feet and that there was this shaking that was happening in the earth whenever God showed up to answer prayer so the prayer that brings breakthrough first of all connects with their history and the sufferings of others. If you want breakthrough in your life, if you want to pray a prayer, see, there's something that has to happen of turning our attention to Jesus. And I love this again, the example from Psalm 2 that they, they're praying. What is it from the scripture that connects with where you're living and then turning that into prayer and worship? That's why we sang this morning, just simply, we come to thank you. Lord.
realizing in our own suffering that we're not alone, that others have suffered before us. Isn't it true that when you're suffering and you're really going through something that it's like loneliness attaches to suffering? Isn't that true? Isn't it true that you just have this feeling like nobody else gets this? Nobody understands what I'm feeling? And even when people tell you, oh yeah, I totally get, I totally understand. You go, shut up, I don't think you do. You don't say that. But that's really not helpful. But there is loneliness that attaches to it. And so part of breakthrough happening is, is connecting with this and realizing that others have suffered. I mean, the reality of the cross has to become real, right? in our own lives, in our own suffering. Secondly, ask for boldness to speak of Jesus. What you've seen and heard. This is really, this is kind of a hard one because um, he's not saying here that you now go out and boldly just start saying something that's formulaic and rote and has no life in it. No, because that, that's just so unnatural and that's not what they were doing. When you get cut by suffering, the first thing you should bleed is the life of Jesus. I'm speaking metaphorically. Okay? When you get cut by suffering, what do you bleed? And what they bled was the life of Jesus. What they had experienced, what they'd seen, and what they'd heard. One of the best resources that I've found on this is our friend Carl Maduris wrote this book, Speaking of Jesus. It's, we have it available in our bookstore, but it is so helpful in this respect because it talks about how we should be naturally speaking of Jesus in our relationships. Many of you have been filled with the Spirit. God's answered your prayers, but when it comes to conflict and suffering and opposition, to speak of Jesus, you just shut down. It's like, well, they told me at my job that I can't talk about Jesus. Just let this text, just settle into this text for a little bit. I'm not telling you go back to your work and go, I am here today and I am going to talk about Jesus. I'm not talking about some, I'm just talking about the life of Jesus. that You just can't help it, but it, com it comes out. God forbid that in all of the settings of our life, whenever people are uncomfortable with us speaking of Jesus and what he's done in our lives, that we, we take our cues from other people's emotion. And a lot of times it's being in those relationships and situations with people where they're going through something and we just kind of pull them aside and ask them more questions and hear their story and then, and then share with them about how we've encountered the life of Jesus. I'm not perfect, but I've found that Jesus has brought me life. And you know, he wants to give you life. I've been praying for you. Something amazing happens. When you bring Jesus, it just naturally flows out of you because it's your life. Use provocation to propel you into asking God for more boldness. And then I love this prayer. They pray, stretch forth your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant Jesus. It doesn't get much better than that. Okay? They told us, don't talk about Jesus. We ask for boldness and we ask that you would stretch forth your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. How about that? How about, Jesus, we would love to see you come in power with more healing. Signs and wonders. We would love to see signs are glimpses of the glory of God. It's heaven breaking through. Breaking through. And by the way, this is not arrogance or triumphalism, which marks much of the Western church and can easily seep into our own thinking. But this is a, a humble boldness. Wouldn't you like to be marked by humility and boldness? 
I'm looking for a positive response there. Because, because it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? But also not a false humility that defers and never speaks what is true. I uh, like to read and read different things, and I read a lot of stuff connected with what we're, what I'm teaching and what we're going through in the text and commentary and different things like that. But I also read other books, and just finished Brene Brown's book from this, or latest, Braving the Wilderness, a great book on the the polarization in our society and how you deal with that. But I was so struck with this other. Actually, I'm reading another book that a friend gave me that's talking about the issue of racism in our country. And in particular, the author of this book talks about African-American, when he was nine years old, some kid beat him up for amusement. And when he came home crying to his father, his dad's answer was, fight that boy or fight me. And then he said, which was godless, and it told me that there was no justice in the world, save the justice we dish out with our own hands. And then at 12 years of age, six boys jumped off of a bus, threw him on the ground, and stomped on his head. He said he was angry. There were all these people walking by, and nobody stopped to help. But he said, then he knew no one, not my father, not the cops, and certainly not anyone's God was coming to save me. And I read that. And I thought, okay. We're in Acts chapter 4, and we're talking about this beautiful picture of how Jesus has come in their suffering. What Jesus would you say to that guy. That guy who says he's an atheist. And I just thought, you know, I'd love to sit down with him and just ask him some more questions to hear more of his story. And if appropriate, ask if we could just pray for a few moments about the suffering that he'd been through and ask this question. Let's just ask Jesus together, where were you when that happened? By the way, as a follower of Jesus, just understand this. I think we're a lot more uncomfortable with questions than he is. He's not like, oh, don't ask that. Oh my gosh. (laughs) We're like nervous. I have personally never experienced praying with someone that has been through suffering and praying that prayer when the person genuinely wanted to know the answer to it where Jesus didn't reveal where he was when the suffering was happening and what he thought about it. I could tell you story after story of people praying with them and it's like when I was abused and we prayed and we invited the Lord to show them where he was during that. And it's like the lights came on and it was like Jesus... I see him in the side of the room and he's weeping. And somehow, knowing that Jesus was present and that he was not okay with it and he was weeping or he was brokenhearted or he was angry, whatever the case may be, something is broken of lies that God doesn't care. And then then the next question that people ask is, so why didn't you stop it? Right? And usually, I'll just be honest with you from my own experience, when I pray that with people, there's silence. Not a big, long answer to the why question. Just like when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me when he was on the cross? Silence. But here's what hit me as I was thinking through this and thinking about sitting down and talking to this guy and, and, and inviting Jesus. 
This guy doesn't know it, but God actually has used his suffering to give him a voice. He's an amazing writer. He doesn't know it, but it's actually Jesus that gave him that gift. He doesn't know it, but actually Jesus is using him to call attention to the injustice in our country. He doesn't know it, but God is actually using his voice to bring healing to people that have been through suffering and haven't been able to name it. He doesn't know it, but Jesus is actually using him. And do you know this, that when you connect with Jesus in your suffering, do you know that when you cry out to him and connect with him, do you know that when you ask him to stretch forth his hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders in the name of his holy servant Jesus, do you know that when you pray that God himself answers, do you know that God takes all of the suffering of your past and it's not like he says, we're going to close that chapter and close that door and lock it. He says, no, open the door. We go, he says, let's go in there together. Nobody in the scripture who is a leader or a hero of the faith, men or women alike, none of them got out of going through suffering. And every single one of them, whatever the enemy intended for evil, God worked it for good. And so that doesn't mean that you come out of suffering and you go, I love that, please give me more. So this morning, I want to encourage you in all of this, what is it Jesus is speaking to you? What is it in your life and your history that he's, that he's weaving together to use for his glory? What is it that he's calling you to? Where in your life do you need breakthrough? Enter in. Let's, let's just, we're going to pray this prayer as we get ready to have communion together. And, and remember this morning, it's not over till it's over. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for just this beautiful picture of your disciples crying out to you in prayer. And Lord, that this prayer pleased you so much that you shook the place. And Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayer today. And in our lives where we live, you would come to overthrow evil, that you would come to be with us. And Lord, that we could be with people who have suffered and encourage them and invite you, Jesus, into the middle of that. I ask for that grace in the name of Jesus.